can't even see from some of the nearest planets to us, who created this tiny little space on which humanity dwells. God stepped into that world because he loves us and he wants us to experience his love. Max Lucado in his book, The Numbers of Hope. The Numbers of Hope, you know what they are? 316. 316. For John 316. Lucado says, I saw a shard of such love between an elderly man and woman who have been married for 50 years. The last decade has been marred by her dementia. The husband did the best he could to care for his wife at home, but she grew sicker. He grew older. So he admitted her to full-time care. One day he asked me to visit her, so I did. Her room was spotless thanks to his diligence. She, horizontal on the bed, was bathed and dressed, though going nowhere. I arrived at 6.15 a.m., he beamed. You'd think I was on the payroll. I feed her, bathe her, and stay with her. I will until one of us dies. That's agape love. Dan Mazeo tells about his dad who was dying of lung cancer. When he learned that Dan was going to be a father, he decided to go on with the chemotherapy. He had been given a year to live, and, and the doctor said, said, put him into chemotherapy. Painful stuff. There were some days that all he could say was, bad day. The day his granddaughter was born, Pop asked to be driven the 90 miles to the hospital. Hurt all the way. They wheeled him in a wheelchair up to the maternity room, to the maternity ward. His son took his little baby girl and held it next to Grandpa because Pop didn't even have the energy to be able to hold the little baby. But with the baby there at his knees, on his lap, Pop leaned down, kissed the little girl, and said, Sheila, Mary, Grandpa loves you very much. Within seconds, Pop dozed off in the wheelchair. <laughs> Within an hour, he was back in the car. Within days, he was dead. That's a picture of agape love. A husband who says, I'm going to do whatever I can to bless her until one of us dies. A grandpa who says, I'm going to endure chemotherapy and I'm going to stay alive to be able to meet this little girl. But folks, that's a semblance of God's amazing love. It's only a flavor of it. It's just a taste of it. Because God's love, His agape love, is unconditional. And God's love, folks, is life-changing. Not only is it powerful and amazing, but it's life-changing and it's meant to be shared. 1 John 4, 9-11 says, This is how, we, how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I wonder if anybody here remembers the significance of December 14, 2012. If you were living in Sandy Hook, you remember that date. Because on that date, a young man who was emotionally, mentally deranged, struggling, killed his mother, then went to the school, and she was a school teacher, went to the school, Sandy Hook Elementary School, killed six staff and 20 young children. 
Up on the screen are the names of the 26 that died. <laughs> if you were to go to the website, most of those, as you click on the name, have a story. And it's the memorial that the family has put up there to remember their, lo their, their little child or their daughter. If I remember correctly, all the staff were ladies. And there's stories attached with all them. If you click on there, you'll not only see the story, but then underneath each story is generally another website where you can go to for some foundation. And I was amazed. And I clicked on every single one of these names. Some, there's nothing there. So you, you try to click and there is, there is no story. Because each family has decided in different ways how they're going to remember their, their loved one, what they wanted to do with, with their grief. But most of them not only have a story, something about the, the child or the teacher, the educator, but then they also have something that that family has done to try to help their memory live on of their child or their loved one. 26 people died at the hands of a young man who was mentally disturbed. I believe it was a, a year later that they were having a prayer vigil, one year anniversary of the prayer, and they were having a prayer vigil and they were putting out candles for the 26 people that died. And it was one of the mothers who was looking at that and she was saying, 26? But there were 28. The same mother has been asked different times, how do you handle what that monster did to your child? Well, you see, this mother's a counselor also herself. And, and so she understands that that young man had problems as well. And so she responds by saying, the first thing is I don't call him a monster. Mm -hmm. Because if I label him a monster, that is going to hurt me even more. That's going to put me in a bad place. <clears throat> it was her six-year-old daughter, Anna Marquez Green, at the memorial service. We, your friends and family, commit to remembering you, your loving heart, generous spirit, and spunky attitude. We know you are with Jesus, and we will tell the world that love wins. And it was, some of you will know, have heard her as, it was Anna Grace, Anna Marquez Green. Anna Grace. It was her mom who at the memorial service held up a sign, love wins. Oh, goody. Oh, you missed it again. Another day in which to excel. <laughs> What's that? Boy, we are slow. How many years have we been doing this? <laughs> God bless. Thanks for bringing him by. Oh, we've tried. Thank you. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> Bye. <clears throat> the post uh, on, on the Facebook page says, Overwhelmed by the outpouring of love and support, love wins in Newtown. As much as December 14 will forever be a day of unfathomable grief for Nelba Marquez Green, that's that's um, Anna Grace's mother. She says, I will never forget that day. But it's all but December 13th is a day of unending gratitude for me. Because she's, Nelba says, on that day. We, I stopped the usual frantic drill, rushing to activities and errands, worrying about the dishes and laundry, even cleaning up the mess on the floor. That morning, Anna Grace, her six-year-old daughter, 
had knocked off the entire nativity scene off of the, off of the piano. Jesus lay on the floor broken in pieces. But mom decided, ah, we're just going to go ahead and leave. She came home on the 13th. She couldn't explain it, but for something compelled her that evening just to ignore it all, not even clean up the mess on the floor. And instead, she corralled Anna, her son Isaiah, her husband Jimmy, got them into the car, and off they went to the Cheesecake Factory. She says, where we had our final time as a family of four. It was the greatest gift. We were sitting there taking goofy pictures Anna was making faces. <laughs> we had second dessert. We had like three pasta dishes. I'm so grateful we had that. Continuing to talk about her experience. Now it says, we were taught to work hard, have faith, and trust God through all of it. This was, by the way, at the memorial. These learnings were tested in the firehouse on December 14, 2012. The firehouse would come to define who we were in the face of disaster. And it doesn't matter who you are, you will ultimately have your own firehouse moment. Your firehouse may be a divorce, job loss, family fracture, illness, addiction, etc. Your firehouse moment will influence you, shape you, rearrange you, perhaps even break you. But it does not ultimately have to define who you are. You get to define who you are. And while we could not control what happened to our family, we could absolutely control how we responded. And so, we did that. By grace. Not only for ourselves and for Anna's memory, but mostly for our son. Now listen to this one mostly for our son who was only eight who incidentally was at the school that day and you have to get a picture of this scene the parents are getting reverse 911 phone calls saying incident at the school reports are starting to come out over te television helicopters flying over the school police are on scene parents are arriving they're being taken into this one firehouse I believe it was is down the road and, and everyone's gathering there and they're just waiting to hear and, and children finally start coming out and children are being delivered to parents and they're, they're being welcomed and excited that their children are alive and one of those is their son their eight-year-old son. He's alive. But then as the local Catholic priest who was also a fire cha chaplain who had ten of his children die that day, he's standing in the local firehouse and the chief stands in front of the parents that are still waiting, still hoping for more kids to come. And the chief stands up and says, there are no more children alive. And the gut-wrenching cry that went across that room that his parents all realized their child wasn't coming out. It was for their eight-year-old son. Had we as his parents allowed our hearts to be filled with hate in that moment, what kind of message would we have sent? We could not do it to him. As much as we were absolutely destroyed, we knew we had to let the love and light in. The love and the light were our survival. We find great comfort in our faith and in our loving, diverse communities of support. Our message was born from this. Love wins. God's love is amazing. It's powerful. And it's meant to be shared, folks. I marvel at these families who have created some just incredible foundations. The work that is being done that would never have happened except for the horror and the tragedy that these families experienced. 
Love is meant to be shared. The gift of Jesus Christ and his love is meant to be shared. And for those of you who are students in other communities, I got a feeling your community needs it as much as ours does. The world needs the amazing, powerful love of God. And it's our job to share it. Incidentally, there's, a, for those of you who are here from Crestline, there's a variety of tools back there for you. And, and even those of you who aren't, uh, everyone, if you didn't get one of the books, there's a, one of those books back there for every family. It, it's the gifts of Christmas, and it's a devotional that you can continue to use through the rest of the weeks. There's cards there, copies of the cards that we mailed out to the community. There's little invite cards. You really would be sad if those sat there. It will really be sad if we come to the week after Christmas. And don't just grab them and throw them away, okay? But it will really be sad if those sit there and don't get given away. If a young family with the loss of their daughter can say love wins and say that to the world and mom can hold it up. Mom, at the funeral of her six-year-old, a little girl who sang and played piano and danced. In fact, she danced from place to place and she loved Jesus. If she can hold that sign up and tell the world love wins and live it, Maybe we could too. Jesus, I'm praying for that journey today for each one of us, that love moves from our head to our hearts, that we accept the love you're offering to us, that we experience it, and we give it away. We share it because we've been blessed. And I thank you, God, that you use imperfect, impatient vessels to accomplish your purposes. And that it's for us, in all of our imperfection, that you died. You love the world so much that you gave your only Son. Not because we were good enough or deserved it. Oh my goodness. In fact, it's because we didn't deserve it, but you loved us that you gave. Now help us to receive and share that gift. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.